Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be in the passage of Scripture today that, um, that Pastor Jimmy read for us a few moments ago. And um, I'm excited to continue this, this series in the Sermon on the Mount. This past Tuesday night, our church gathered together for a night of prayer. And, um, and y'all, it was, it was incredible just to be able to come to this place and sing songs um, together to, uh, to just join in prayer, um, praying heartfelt, biblical, Scripture-fed prayer. And um, I hope that next time we do that, because we're going to do it again, I hope that next time you make plans to join us uh, for that night of prayer. Last week we finished up uh, the Lord's Prayer, working through Jesus teaching his disciples how to pray, but before he got to teaching them how to pray, he taught them how not to pray. Don't pray as the hypocrites do. Before that, you, will, you would see at the very beginning of, of chapter 6 where Jesus talks about giving to the needy, uh, practicing our righteousness in front of other people in order to be seen by them. And he says, don't do this. Um, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So then today we get to where Jesus begins to, to turn his gaze upward and to turn our gaze upward. As we learned to pray last week, today we're learning what it looks like to lay up treasures in heaven rather than treasures on earth. And I want to I begin kind of with a story before we jump into our passage of Scripture. There's an author by the name of Kent Hughes who wrote a book of, um, on the Sermon on the Mount. And in this book, he tells this story. He says, Mrs. Bertha Adams was 71 years old when she died alone in West Palm Beach, Florida on Easter Sunday, 1976. The coroner's report read these words, cause of death, malnutrition. After wasting away to 50 pounds, she could no longer stay alive. When the state authorities made their preliminary investigation of her home, they found a veritable pig pen. In fact, they said it was the biggest mess that you can imagine. One seasoned inspector described that, and he said that he had never seen a dwelling in greater disarray. Bertha had begged food at her neighbor's doors and had gotten what clothes she had from the Salvation Army. From all appearances, she was a penniless recluse, a pitiful and forgotten widow. But such was not the case. In fact, amid the jumble of her filthy, disheveled belongings was found two keys to safe deposit boxes at two local banks. The discovery was unbelievable. The first box contained over 700 AT&T stock certificates plus hundreds of other valuable notes, bonds, and solid financial securities, not to mention cash amounting to $200,000. That's just the first box. The second box had no certificates, just cash, $600,000 to be exact. Bertha Williams was a millionaire and then some, yet she died of starvation. Her case was even more tragic if she was destitute spiritually. Kent Hughes continues, her life is an extreme parable of the lethal dangers of materialism, which promises so much but cannot give us what we need most. And then I want to invite you to take your hand out, out and look. At the bottom of your handout is this quote from Kent Hughes, our consumer society is constantly telling us that life at its best consists of having more and more possessions and pleasures. As Christians, we know this is patently false, but the tug is so strong that many of us try a balancing act between what the Bible teaches and what the advertisements say, between the spiritual riches God offers us in Christ and worldly treasures that cannot feed our soul. Sadly, some of us lose our balance and the results are devastating. Now, in light of this introduction, let's go back to the passage of Scripture we read earlier, Matthew chapter 6. We're going to read verses 19 through 24 again just to help us be reminded of God's Word, what it says, and then we're going to work to pull it apart. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. 
If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Let's pray together. Father, as we approach your word today, we want to do so with clear minds, open hearts, to not only understand what your word says and how it applies to our lives, but Father, we want the Holy Spirit to be so clearly evident at work in our lives that, Father, we know how to respond to it. Because, Father, we believe that your word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and that it will cut us all the way down to the bone of who we are. With the result being that we're closer to you, that we're more God-honoring Christians as a result of studying your word. So, Father, as we approach it today, we pray that we do so with a mind that is seeking to learn and understand and a heart that is seeking to act based on it. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, we're going to walk through this passage and kind of get the big picture overview, but then next week when we come back together, we're actually going to go back to this passage again and learn more about what we find here in these verses. But it starts off there with the words, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Now that very first phrase there, uh, the, the phrase, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, in the original Greek, it literally means this. It means do not treasure up treasures for yourselves. Do not treasure up treasures for yourself. Now, as I was thinking this week about, about this phrase, I realized that in the context of all Scripture, Scripture has a whole lot to say about laying up treasures for, for ourselves. And so I want to show you just here for just a moment as we focus just on this one point about not laying up treasures for ourselves, I want to talk about kind of how we do that sometimes. First of all, um, what we find oftentimes is that we seek to build up treasure to gain the upper hand to gain the upper hand. And you can, it's not in your notes, but you can write this at the bottom of your page as you take notes today. There's a whole lot of things that we can give our hearts to in this world. In fact, most often in our our American um, first world culture, we give our hearts to whatever it is that we own. Um, And as long as we can own something that's better than somebody else, then we're rich no matter how much money we have in our bank account. So if, if we can just have the biggest and the best, then we are good to go. So if Mr. Jones has it, then Mr. Smith has to have it, except Mr. Smith has to have the better model than Mr. Jones has, right? A person who attempts to lay up for themselves treasures on earth is always gaining, but they're never satisfied. When you try to lay up treasures for yourself, you are always gaining, but you're never satisfied. Secondly, I think about how we often build up treasure to ensure a life of ease. If I can just have enough, then my life will be pretty easy. I won't have to work quite as hard to gain a dollar, to earn a dollar. If I can just earn enough. Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21, Jesus talks about this kind of person. um, And here's what he says. It says there that he told them a parable saying this. The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store up my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared... Whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Now, the the issue here is not that this man builds bigger barns. The issue is that he tore down his barns and built bigger barns for the purpose of building himself a life of ease. If I can just store up enough to where I don't have to do anything, eat, drink, be merry is what he says there. God says, you're not guaranteed anything. phrase that Jesus uses there is, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. In other words, they've gained their wealth so they can hoard it, so they can be lazy for the rest of their lives, and they don't treat it as a gift from God that should be utilized for the glory of God. 
This leads me to the third point as we talk about this idea of treasures being built up for ourselves. We often build up treasures and we often fail in our stewardship of those treasures. We fail in our stewardship of those treasures. There's a sphere of evangelicalism that teaches that it is wrong for a Christian to have any kind of wealth, to gain any kind of of amount of money. And that is absolutely wrong because that's not what God teaches in his word. God does gift some people with the ability to build businesses or to create things or to work jobs or invest in such a way that they can earn a lot of money in doing so. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong at all. However, when God has gifted any of us as Christians with any amount of resources, whether it's a little bit or a whole lot, the Christian has a responsibility to be a good steward of those resources. It doesn't matter if you're financially rich or poor, our earthly treasures have got to be stewarded well. There's a pastor who came across uh, two men in in the same week. It was two different men in the same week, but um, both of them were very similar in that they had both gained an enormous amount of money throughout their lifetime. The first one was a a former university professor who made some really smart real estate deals. And over the span of his life, um, he had accumulated roughly $100 million, so a whole lot of money. The problem, though, was that he got to the end of his life, and in the process of making all that money, he had lost his family, he had lost his happiness, and he had lost his peace of mind. Now, the other man that this pastor came across had made a whole lot of money through investments, but they were investments in which he paid very little attention to. They weren't big deals to him. Instead, because of his financial independence, he gave away much of what he earned to the church. In contrast to the other person, this was one of the godliest, happiest, most fruitful, and most content people that this pastor had ever met. Now, in the case of the first man, He accumulated a fortune that became an idol. He used it only for himself. The second man stewarded the wealth that he had accumulated, and instead of it becoming an idol, it became a tool that he used ultimately for God's glory. Jesus continues here in this passage in Matthew chapter 6 by saying that any treasure we build up for ourselves on earth is in danger of being lost. You see the word moth there, rust, thieves. Those are all things that take away, aren't they? They leave things worse than when they arrived on the scene. I told you about a professor that that Hillary had in college who had put everything that he had in the stock market. He put his retirement, his savings, every bit of money he had, he put it in the stock market. And in one day, every bit of it was gone. Just one day, every bit of it was gone. And he's at the end of his life at retirement age with nothing at all. An earthly treasure can be lost in a moment. But Jesus is telling us that there is a treasure that's a whole lot more important than the earthly one. He says this in verses 20 and 21. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Now, what does that mean? It's not money that you can put in the bank, right? It's not in the case of, of this man in Luke chapter 12, where grain that you can put in a grain bin. What Jesus is saying there is that Christians are rewarded in eternity according to how they live their lives here on this earth. Did you catch that? I'm going to say it again. Christians are rewarded in eternity according to how they live their lives here on this earth. What Jesus is trying to communicate is that what's eternal is important, not what is temporary here in this world. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 through 14, it's going to be on the screen for you, but Paul's teaching the church about this very thing. He says this, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ, which which is Jesus Christ. By the way, let me stop there for a second. What, What Paul's saying is that salvation cannot be earned. There are people, many people, who think, you know what, if I just live a good enough life, <clears throat> or if I, if I give enough money away to, to the poor people, or if I just do enough for the church, then God will be happy with me and I'll make it into heaven. But that's not how it works at all. In fact, there's salvation that comes in no other way except through Jesus. 
So because your salvation has a foundation that's laid, that is only Jesus Christ, now Paul says this. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation that's already been built, remember, already been built, they build on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day, you see there that that word day is capitalized. It's talking about the judgment day, the bema seat of of Jesus Christ, where one day all Christians are going to stand before God and what we did on this earth is going to be weighed. Is it good? Is it bad? I'll, I'll process this more here in just a moment. But for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. What Paul's teaching here and what we find according to the context of all of God's word is that there's coming a day in which the, the actions, the heart intentions of Christians is going to be judged. It's going to go through a fire. And if it comes out on the other side as gold, silver, precious stones, then those are going to be rewards that are laid up for us, that are given to us in heaven. But if those actions go through the fire and they're burnt up like wood, hay, and straw, then they're gone forever. That's how important it is to live a godly Christian life here on this earth because we're building up rewards for the future. What's done for the kingdom of God is going to be that gold and silver and precious stones. And what's done for ourselves, that's the wood, hay, and straw. The wood, hay, and straw is going to burn up. The gold, silver, and precious stones are going to go through the fire and they're going to become rewards in heaven. A person cannot earn heaven. But what they can earn is rewards in heaven once heaven is secured. And remember, secured, heaven is secured only through Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. It's the whole purpose for Jesus coming to earth, to give us life, to die the death that we deserve to die, to give us that free gift of heaven. Later on in Matthew, in the book of Matthew, chapter 13, Jesus talks about how precious heaven is when he says this. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Heaven is so precious that it's worth you giving up everything to have it. The rewards of heaven are so valuable that it's worth us forsaking everything in this short, temporary life in order to obtain those rewards. Now, in this treasure that's laid up in heaven, moth, rust, they can't destroy those rewards. Thieves can't break in and steal it. It's not like here on earth where the stability of the stock market could make us lose it all in one moment. We then read, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now what God's saying here when he says this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What he's saying is that by putting your treasure in the right place in your heart, your heart is not necessarily going to be automatically in the right place. But the location of your treasure will be an indicator of where your heart is. Um, How many of you have seen that check engine light in your car? (laughs) If you haven't, boy, I'd love to have your car. (laughs) We all see it at some point where the check engine light comes on and, and it's telling us there's a problem somewhere, right? Somewhere you've got a problem that needs to be fixed and you can't tell what that problem is until you go get a computer put on your car and it tells you what, what code is, is tripping. How many of you drive around all the time with your check engine light on? (laughs) There's some who do that. I used to do that. And my dad got on to me enough where I didn't do that anymore. What Jesus is saying is that treasures on earth are like that check engine light. When that light is on, when we're more concerned with earthly treasures than we are laying up treasures in heaven, then there's a problem with our heart and some research is necessary to figure out what's going on. And that's where this next couple of verses come in, verses 22 and 23. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. 
If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Jesus is saying something that's really, really simple here. He's saying what you allow into your life through your eyes is going to affect all of who you are. Light enters the body through the eye. So physically speaking, your life has light because your eye processes light that's around you. Uh, how many of you yesterday, because it was such a nice day, you went outside and worked some? Anybody? Yeah, that was me and, and the four boys we got outside. And one of the things we did was we washed our two cars. Now, um, washing cars with four boys between the ages of eight and three, it is inevitable that I'm going to be sprayed with a water hose over and over again. And that's exactly what happened. But you know what? They lo absolutely love it. We worked hard for about an hour washing both cars on the outside, and I thought these things look legit. In fact, the wheels look nice and clean for the first time in quite a while because, you know, it's been the wintertime. Hadn't had a chance to, to really clean them well. But then last night, we got in the van to go ride as a whole family to go ride and, and run an errand. And as soon as I sit down in the seat, I look through the windshield and I think that is the nastiest windshield I've ever seen in my life because there's watermarks all over the windshield. Now, on the outside of the van, it looked really, really good. But on the inside, when I look through that windshield, I realize there's a major, major problem here. So this morning, I get in my truck. It's dark outside, y'all. And it is filthy. And I can see all the watermarks and just how dirty my windshield is. I spent all that time getting sprayed over and over and over again for a dirty windshield. The one thing that I got to make sure is clean on the vehicle when I'm done. But you know what? As I think about this passage, I think about what, what Jesus is trying to say here. And I ask that question that you see on your screen, how's your eyes? Because your eye is like that windshield. It can be really, really clean. You can look really, really clean on the outside. In fact, when people look at you, they think, you know what? That is a person who's laying up those treasures in heaven. But yet what's really going on is that there's something else. You're laying up treasures here on earth, not laying up treasures in heaven. Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells a story about a rich man who refused to give a beggar anything at all. In fact, that beggar is outside his door and he's just longing for the crumbs from the rich man's table. The rich man looked really, really good. The rich man, if you looked at him, you would have thought, this is a good man, a good person. But he would never give the beggar anything, not even the scraps off his table. He's so caught up in the earthly treasure that he wouldn't do anything. Jesus continues to tell this story where both men die and the poor man, Lazarus, is carried up to heaven while the rich man is taken to hell. We read in Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 23, these words. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things. And Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. You know, the issue, the, what sent the rich man to hell and the poor man to heaven was not the rich man's wealth. It was not the poor man's lack of wealth. Only one thing matters in the end. The end of our lives, we look back, are we able to say, I gave it all for Christ because he gave it all for me? Or are we going to say, look at everything I built up. Look at what I have done. 
if your answer is centered on the I, then you have a problem with treasures on this earth rather than treasures in heaven. But if your answer is, oh, look at what Jesus has done for me and what I have a chance to do for him, then you're laying up treasures in heaven. Jesus teaching here on the Sermon on the Mount, he ends with this verse. He says, no one can serve two masters for either he's going to hate the one and love the other or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So now here's a question to, for you to ask yourself. What is it that I'm devoted to? What am I devoted to? Am I devoted to money and my treasure here on earth or am I devoted to building God's kingdom and doing his will? You see, for a whole lot of people, if they've got money, then they've got a sense of control in an uncontrollable world. But it's a false control, and it cannot take, they cannot take it with them when they die. The words of the poem by C.T. Studd, only one life to live will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. So let me ask you, what kind of treasure are you laying up for yourself? A treasure on earth or a treasure in heaven? Is it gold, silver, precious stones that's going to stand the test of eternity? Or is it the wood, hay, and straw that's going to burn up on the day of judgment? There was a poor man who, when, um, when his friend asked him how he was doing, he said, I'm doing great. His friend said, great. He said, yeah, my days are good. The friend said, well, what about the bad ones? The poor man said, well, in the bad ones, I still rejoice that God is good, and I'm happy when he sends sun. I'm happy when he sends the rain. His will has become my will. I'm a child of his, therefore I'm happy. His friend asked, well, how do you maintain this mentality? The poor man said, I'm a king. To which the friend asked, well, where's your kingdom? The poor man replied, in my heart. I don't have to pile stuff up here because God is going to give it all to me free in his kingdom, which is coming in the future. I love that. God is going to give it all to me free. This man's joyous, kingdom-minded, eternal outlook on life is one that I think a whole lot of Christians should adopt for themselves. And it may be one that you need to adopt for yourself. Where are you laying up treasures today? On earth or in heaven? Next week, we're going to pull this idea apart some more just to help us understand what it looks like to lay up those treasures in heaven. How do we do that? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And Father, I pray that, um, that what we've talked about today changes our outlook on life, but Father, that it draws us closer to you. It helps us understand that only what is done in this life for Christ will last. Father, there's a lot of things that we can work for. We can build up a treasure for ourselves that, um, man, people, people envy but what's going to bring true fulfillment and happiness is our relationship with you. And that fulfillment and happiness will be eternal. It's not something we can just expect for this life. Father, continue to direct our gaze towards you, to lift our eyes up, to seek out your will, to live our lives in such a way that honors you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.